Columbia University Club of Wilmington's first virtual book club. Um, I have to put out my thanks and shouts to Sula Mistras, who has made the contacts and the connections in order to make this happen. We at the Hellenic University Club of Wilmington have a mission of promoting Greek culture, Hellenism, and education with our uh, meetings, our uh, shows, or not shows, but actually uh, speakers, guest speakers with some seminars. And we also have a annual scholarship for our rising college students coming out of high school or high school seniors. And in doing so, we want to infuse not only the pride that we have in our culture, in our language, but in the people that, of what we call, um, you know, the heart, the, uh, the heart of the Greek people. And we want to continue. So I want to thank uh, Sula for coordinating the, the uh, committee for this. And I want to thank Art Demopoulos for also uh, joining us with his group. And at this point, I would like to toss it over to Art. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Art Demopoulos. I'm executive director of the National Hellenic Society. And it's a real privilege and honor to host, first of all, an incredible speaker and uh, to welcome up my co-moderator, Bill Anthos, who's also a member of the National Hellenic Society. And what's really unique about this partnership that we're forging today is this is going to be part of our NHS Talks Stories episodic, uh, uh, let's just say archive, that we're going to share with the National Hellenic Museum as part of the Greek American story. So you better all be good, including me. <laughs> uh, it, it, save it for posterity for ju future generations to, to enjoy. And Mary, uh, I'm sorry, but this means that at some point in time in the future, we're going to do your oral history as one of the great Phil Hellenes. Um, so we're, we're really honored. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Bill Antholis. What can you say about Bill? You know, he's a great public servant, a great administrator, great father, husband, Yankee fan. We can't all be perfect, but uh, sorry, Bill. Uh, Bill is a CEO of the Miller Center of Public Affairs, which is a nonpartisan affiliate of the, of the famous University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it is, specializes in presidential scholarship, public policy, and political history. Bill was also managing director of the Bank. We get to spend some time with you all, and thanks to Art and everything that NHS does to build a real community across the country of um, Hellenes and Phil Hellenes. And then finally, thanks to Mary. Um, yes. I fell in love with Mary Norris exactly a year ago. Um, when, hey. um, I'm here. St we, okay. start, we started going to Greece about 10 years ago. Uh, and we go every year the last two weeks in June. And we usually arrive June 15th. Um, and last year, we discovered when we were sitting poolside that we were both reading the same book. Uh, and the book was Greek to me. Um, and uh, we, we were each recommended this book by different people, uh, which is a sign of the power of the book. Kristen was not born Greek, but um, through these annual trips to Greece and through the immersion in our family has become more Greek than me in many ways. And as we read through the book, we kept trying to beat one another. We kept racing ahead to see who could get in front so that we could read the other person the side splitting line, or the more importantly, the perfectly perceptive line about Greek history, Greek culture, Greek language, or just humanism in general. So a little bit about Mary and how she came to this book, and then we'll dive right in. Mary spent a career at the New Yorker as a copy editor. Uh, if you know about The New Yorker or read The New Yorker, it is the pinnacle of American journalism, and it prides itself on perfectly crafted prose, as well as incredibly persistent and perfectionist copy editing. And Mary's first book was Between You and Me, colon, Confessions of the Comma Queen. And what it was about was the debates 
over punctuation. Now in our own family, the simple version of this is let's eat grandma. And if you put a comma after eat, it saves grandma's life. <laughs> Mary's first book expanded upon that and showed how different writers cared about the language differently, but also her efforts to steer some of the great writers and editors into grammatical perfection. And after having accomplished that great feat and a book that became a bestseller and um, praised by, as one of the great books of the year by a range of different critical reviews like the Kirkus Review and the New York Times Review of Books, the New York Review of Books, Mary then went to what has clearly been a lifelong passion since she was an undergrad at Rutgers where she studied Greek mythology. And then across all of her years as a copy editor at the New Yorker, she had a love for Greek language, Greek history, Greek mythology, and she studied Greek on the side for fun. Something that as the son of a Greek school teacher was never fun for me. <laughs> and so the book is a telling of Greek culture, Greek history, but also human history and humanity itself through the lens of the Greek language. Um, she does more eloquently what Gus, the father in my big fat Greek wedding, does in the famous car ride with the kids in the back, where he says, tell me any word and I'll tell you where the word comes from in Greek. And my mother did this to me and I do it to my own kids. Mary does it as an art form. And for a Greek, she does it in a way that gives it um, relevance and legitimacy. And for my wife, she did it in a way that was humorous and resonated with her own experiences of living with Greeks or a Greek and traveling to Greece. So Mary, it's really a thrill and a delight to have you with us tonight. Well, that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know that there's anything left for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mary, let us, let us start then with just a little bit of, for those who haven't read the book, I, as I thought about what we would talk about, I'm sure that there are people out there who are fans and who have read the book, but probably some people who haven't. So give us a little bit of a history of the book. Why did you write it? And what, is the, what do you think is the core story? Well, I wrote that book about English grammar. And while I was writing that book, and by the way, I'm like the poster girl for late bloomers. Okay, I've been writing all my life. I first thought of writing a little poem when I was about six years old or maybe earlier. And um, something that I wrote in first grade made my father laugh. And that made, you know, that was that made it an ambition for me. If I could make my father laugh, then writing was a very good thing to be able to do. Um, when I got to write the book, you know, so I'd been writing and writing and not having that much luck getting published. And I finally started, I found a subject in my day job, writing about um, English grammar. And while I was writing that book under deadline, I got offered, um, uh, to go, I got an offer to go on a press trip uh, uh, to Greece, to Thessaloniki and Athens and areas in the Peloponnese that was um, a show of Byzantine art that Greece was sending to the States. And I felt guilty about going, but I had to go. There was no way I <laughs> was going to um, refuse to turn down this invitation. So to assuage my conscience while I was in Greece that spring, it must have been 2013, I started making notes on, on the Greek alphabet and on the Greek language, which I'd studied seriously about 30 years earlier. My first immersion in Greek was in the early 1980s. So I tried, I thought, well, surely Greek is so important. There surely will be room for this in a book about English grammar. <laughs> so many words, you know, there's so many words we can learn to, that come. English words that are derived from Greek, and it's a good way to know how to spell them, is to have these this background. Like Although the I word comma know. itself. Comma, right, <laughs> uh -huh. meaning segment, something cut off. It's interesting that that word actually refers to the whole phrase before the comma, but, but people now just think it means the little mark. So anyway, I'll try to speed this up a little. When my first book then was a, a success and I got an opportunity to write another book, all of that material about Greek 
you know, I called it like um, an elf, an ABC Darien for the barbarian, you know, phi is for feta, trying to explain to people that they really knew a lot of Greek already. They just didn't know they knew it. Uh, my editor said, would you like to write a book about Greek? And I, yes, of course I would. So that's how I got to write it. I would not have gotten to write the book about Greek if I hadn't written the book about English. And I had two big boxes from my studies back in the 80s and 90s. One was labeled modern Greek and the other was labeled um, Greek drama because that seemed to be what most of the notes were. I had saved everything, which was really lucky um, because I had this ton of material to get back into. And yet I have a feeling sometimes because the, you know there's so much history, I have this feeling a lot of the time that the book manages to be shallow. It's everything I know about Greek, but every subject would fall into something deeper for me. Even the title, Greek to me, you know, you think that that's, um, it's from Shakespeare. I thought Shakespeare made it up, but then I thought about it and Shakespeare didn't make up every line, every word that is in, that is in his place. Shakespeare used expressions people used too. So Greek to me is not necessarily invented by Shakespeare. We just have an example of its use. And then it turns out that all, that, what do you say in Greek? You can't say Greek to me. You say Chinese to me, I believe, or perhaps you say <laughs> Anglica. <laughs> I don't know. So it turns out that even the title, which had just come to me spontaneously, and it's not a very original title, has this, you know, I could write another book about the title. And everything that I approached, you know, I mean, some, obviously, there's a lot of material about Socrates, and there's a lot of scholarship on um, the transmission of texts. And even, you know, everything modern, everything ancient, everything had like a whole globe of material under it that I was trying to digest. And, the only, and I panicked. I, I actually got pretty panicky for a while while I was trying to write the book because I, I have bit off more than I can chew. That, that would calm me down. Plus I prayed to Athena a lot <laughs> for, for reassurance. I want, I want to come back to Athena because she's so, she is probably the beating heart and the most powerful ancient character. Uh, and maybe a way of getting there, Mary, particularly for people who have read it is the book is not based just on that one trip when you went in 2013. It's over 20 or more years of traveling back and forth to modern Greece, yeah. where you've clearly learned how to use the modern Greek language, even though you're also well-educated in ancient Greek. And for many of us modern Greeks or Greek Americans, we often see a difference between the two. And I was really quite struck at how much you tie ancient Greece to the present. So can you talk about what you think is consistent and maybe also what you feel might be lost in translation from ancient Greek to modern Greek? Well, I think you know, it's not something that I did consciously or even think of in, in these terms, but the thing that's consistent, of course, is, is the humanity is, you know, that people are still, you know, babies are born stone age. I mean, they figure out how to use phones pretty quickly, I think, but um, everybody is born as, as a, a clean slate. And, uh, you know, baby today is the same as a baby born in ancient Greece or in Rome. They have to get, um, educated in their own culture things that are in Homer and all the gods, all the mythology, that, that that was human, that was general and that was universal. And, you know, it might be a little confusing to read in Plato that Socrates did not believe in the old gods or, but, but I've come to see that what those gods are, I mean, instead of being distant creative forces, which, you know, I guess maybe the ancient Greeks believed they were, what they are to me is elements of our own spirits. You know, so I, I am devoted to Athena, and it's not that I am necessarily Athena-like. 
I am, I'm an independent woman and she's a very good model for that. And I have gray green eyes, which I like to think is the color that Homer was referring to. And I am in very much in favor of education. Love about Athena in her role as a goddess of war is that she'll try diplomacy first. And I just had an, an, um, a potential conflict with a neighbor today and I was trying to defuse it. And I kept thinking, what would Athena do? And, and, and I kept waiting. We're both outside working on our houses and, and I have, I'm having a roof put on the house tomorrow and I have to get him to cooperate by putting his stuff away. So I'm, I promise you there is a thread that I can get back to. Athena, you know, as a mentor, remember how she would always say to Odysseus, go and find somebody nice at court. Uh, you know, when he, he lands, I think it's on the second last island before he gets back to Ithaca, and um, talk to the king's wife. <laughs> it's all kind of planned out. And that is what occurred to me. I didn't want to go into this situation with neighbor just off the top of my head. Say, hey, buddy, you got to move your stuff tomorrow. Remember? You know, I didn't want to do it that way. And so I did all the work I had to do and got ready you know, it was the last thing before taking the garbage out. I was just going to say, mention, um, oh, remember the roofers are coming tomorrow. And then if he got upset, I was going to flee. <laughs> but the important thing is that I didn't just blurt something out without a plan. You know, it is good to have some kind of a plan. And that's what Athena would counsel. Um, but this is just, I think Athena is just like one thread of me. The neighbor he is a devotee of Aries, I would say. <laughs> um, maybe some other gods are mixed in there, but I think I also have a little bit of uh, Aphrodite in that I think, not that I am beautiful, but I think that every woman has some kind of a re relationship with beauty, a slave to her beauty, <laughs> or whether she's trying always to be her best, or whether she denies it and tries you know, not to worry about it. Um, so there's a little bit of Aphrodite, and that I cover in the book in the chapter on Cyprus. And there's a big dose of Demeter because of the suffering and sadness in life. And I think I got that somewhat through my mother. My father, I associate with Hephaestus. He was a fireman, and his father, his grandfather, was um, a blacksmith, actually. So you know, there really is a, a strong um, physical connection, that same kind of work that, you know, I think he had other elements. He had a little bit of Poseidon. He introduced me to the sea. My point here is that that, as, that humans have not changed. They still have all these elements in them. They still, like Hephaestus, I always wondered, why, why, did, why is one of the gods lame? Why can't gods be perfect? And I think it's because, of course, the Greek gods were very human. And I think Hephaestus serves as an example of somebody who compensated for a disability, who, you know, his legs were weak, and so he built up his upper body and he made himself essential with the things that he could do with fire. Mary, um, I'm uh, relaying a question from Constantine and Maria Karras, uh, who want to thank you for so eloquently writing about your experiences in Greece and how the Greek language has evolved. And they ask, are you concerned that because the English language is so, now so widespread because of social media, television, and the fact that English has become the language of international business, that Greek and many other European languages will follow the way of Latin over the next hundred years or so? Uh, that is, you know, that's a worry. Uh, I've heard people say that, that um, modern Greek might, you know, because so many Greeks speak English, and it's, it's, um, it's hard for me to get anyone to practice with me when I go to Greece. Um, of course, I have to believe that they'll continue, certainly that the humanities will continue, and that modern Greek will continue. But it would be so dull to have a world with just one language in it. The, um, you know, so much of the character of the people is contained in the language. The language kind of illuminates the people. So I don't think that's going to change. No. People uh, have their character. I'm curious, Mary, how much do you keep up with 
other things in contemporary society written about ancient Greece. My, my kids read all the Rick Riordan novels, right? Um, there's a, a, uh -huh. a great, terrific young writer writing no. now um, who's just written this book on Circe and she had written Song of Achilles, um, Madeline Miller. Um, right. Do you mm -hmm. keep up with those kinds of things as well? Do you keep up with the, moder the popularization of ancient and modern Greece? I do, because if there weren't the popularizers, you know, we wouldn't get what we need. Um, there's always arguments about the new translations of things, especially a um, lot of translations of Homer in recent years. And I think that's such a wonderful, healthy sign. Of course, the translators all argue and they're, you know, about whose translation is the best and what is, what kind of principles you have to apply. And you know, there's another subject that I could have written another book about, about, you know, translation of, of Greek. Um, and anyway, that seems to me a very hopeful sign that um, the Hellenic world is going to stay with us, that it's not just Madeline Miller and um, Daniel Mendelssohn, but there's writers in Australia. There's uh, David Malouf, who's written a book called Ransom, that is about you know, the Iliad. And there's Pat Barker in England, who wrote her own version of um, the women in the Iliad. And it goes on and on. Um, and I, I, read, I read all those books. I, <laughs> I certainly lay my hands on all those books. I also like the theater things in New York. There are, um, there's something, you know, the theater of war. Um, let's see, and Brian Dor Dorries, who uses readings, staged readings of tragedies to help people cope with the tragedies of our own time. And they work, it works. You know, he has a reading and then he opens it up for discussion. And people start saying really honest, heartbreaking things. And the tragedy has its effect. You go out, you leave feeling clean, feeling um, renewed and, and also lucky that that didn't happen to you. <laughs> Another effect of Greek tragedy. Uh, Mary, we do have a, a Facebook uh, commenter that said, uh, if you can get past Mr. Cyclops' hard edges, you'll find a deeply warm heart spoken from another child of Aries. So there's, there's oh, some optimism. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> all right. I made some progress today then. <clears throat> and Aries even, you know, my father had a streak of Aries. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mary, I want to ask you about modern Greece. You, the, as you mentioned in the chapter on Aphrodite, you travel to Cyprus. You travel all over and you talk about some of those places. You go to the Peloponnese. At the end of the book, I think, if I remember correctly, you end up in Cardamili at the home of Patrick Lee Fermer, the great British writer who writes about modern Greece. T tell us a little bit about your travels in modern Greece. Uh, you mentioned going to Thessalonica on that on that trip. Um, what stands out to you about traveling in modern Greece, um, the various places, the parts of Greece, but also how it's changed over the last 25 or 30 years as you've, as you've made your trip? Well, it has changed a lot. Um, certainly, if you take Athens, the first time I went, I guess, was 1983. And I had a map of Athens that I saved diligently and took back with me every time I went, even though it was in shreds. And finally, I realized that just because the city is old doesn't mean it's not always changing. That map was obsolete. What I think <laughs> I've found, um, you know, you can, when you travel, you can go with expectations. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, travel with expectations of creating their own home environment. You know, they want their usual morning coffee, they want their afternoon nap, they, they get grouchy if the bread isn't the way they like it. And um, I, that's something I knew from the beginning, that I could not impose my own vision of what I wanted to see on what was there. So you have to be open to what's there. Um, you know, when I went to Ithaca, I had some, and this, I don't think this even made it into the book because, 
you know, nothing happened. The story about returning to Ithaca was Odysseus' story. And my own Ithaca would be something else. And so what I saw in Ithaca was gardens with cucumbers in them. You know, it's, <laughs> it was just all normal and normal. What is, what is that? But, um, you know, the, and the, the Greeks are carrying on. They're uh, renting rooms. They're trying to make a living. They will try to get more money, squeeze as much money out of you as they can. That's, it's, they're making a living. And, and I, and I, um, I know there's just something about something that I don't think will change that you do run into Greek people who are just so interesting and resourceful. I think that the Greeks are very resourceful. I also love the dogs. <laughs> I love all the animals that you see. You know, I don't see, I see a couple of cats and dogs here in Rockaway, once in a while a possum. Um, but in in Greece, you use the, those, those wild dogs that live in Athens. Think how much they know. They know, you know, they've passed genetic information since probably, you know, probably the time of Socrates. They know all the best spots in Athens. <laughs> Mary, uh, okay, here's a, a real quick fire, a round of, a, 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 a quick round of, of, of quick questions and answers. Favorite philosopher? Socrates. Favorite myth? Wow. <laughs> uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. I'm going to go with the apple, the, the apple in Paris choosing who is the most beautiful between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Okay. Favorite archaeological you know site? Oh my gosh. Um, it's the Tholos in Delphi, the um, temple to Athena. And how about in, in Cyprus? In Cyprus, well, I loved in Cyprus the mosaics in Paphos, but those are Roman. And here's a tough one. Favorite Greek word? Whoa, whoa. Hmm. Or top top five. We'll do a letter. No, I, I like I like chaos a lot. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of it these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, chaos and psyche, 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 psyche. Yeah. Psyche. Yes, I like that one. But now you know I'm just reaching for um, words like um, tzatziki. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, classy, I like, but you know, right. other associates. You should, you should know, Mary, my my other daughter, one daughter's here, the other daughter's not here, wrote one of her college essays on tzatziki. <laughs> <laughs> I approve. <laughs> <laughs> favorite, favorite Greek food? I was going to ask that too. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. I would have to say probably a shrimp. You know, shrimp prepared with lemon, olive oil, garlic, and oregano. Mm. And how about your favorite custom in Greece? That it's ah, the pouring of the libation. That's an old, I mean, I'm, maybe you don't do that, but I do. <laughs> Something that I picked up from Homer. You know, how they always pour libations. Um, and you know, offer to the gods the smoke before the meal. That's certainly the, uh, I think it has to be the origin of our custom of saying grace in modern times, right? Um, pause and thank the gods before. Well, so I do like to um, just give a little libation of anything I drink, especially alcohol. I don't do it with coffee, <laughs> but with <laughs> wine or anything. And if I'm not in a place where I can spill a little out, I just Put a drop on my finger and flick it, and that's my. And I'm quite superstitious about it. <laughs> favorite favorite place in Greece today? Out, uh, two questions in Athens. What's your favorite place in Athens? And, and restaurant. Of and restaurant. Yeah. Oh, I'm not that good at the restaurants. I don't know. <clears throat> I have had. <clears throat> what's his name? Manos. I can remember the, the guy's name who ran the restaurant, but I like the restaurants that are around the other side of 
the Placa and the Acropolis, let's see, what would it be? I think it would be the east side. A lot of places in there that um, are very hilly. And uh, you, know, you can sit on a porch and look out and see people yeah. as, as you're eating. I love those. Um, my, my, oh gosh, I have to say right now, I suppose my favorite place is the, the new museum of the Acropolis. The new Acropolis Museum is um, so inspiring. And, and of course, how could I not visit the Acropolis every time I go there and, and get, see how work progresses on the that, Parthenon. Uh, uh, it's remarkable, but 50% of today's Greek words exist in Homer. Moreover, we see the same words in linear B. And also the lingua franca of an era is the language of the empire of the time. Latin was once the lingua franca, but Greek survived. Yes, yes, and Greek will continue to survive. It's just um, um, a unique language. And I was always so grateful while traveling in Greece that the Greeks were, were open to, you know, some a non-Greek fumbling with their language. <laughs> uh, Mary, I, on that point, I was struck. I'm reading a biography of Lincoln right now. And there's a town in Ohio, I think southwest of Columbus, called uh, Xenia. Yeah, we call it Xenia, of course. Oh, of course. Xenia, <laughs> I think, yes. That's funny. You know, there's also a town in Ohio called Akron that it took me years to figure out that that's from Akros. It's um, this little town of Akron, south of Ohio, is on a slightly higher plane. So I guess it's the beginning of the Allegheny Mountains. But Ak Akron is, is from the Greek. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? <laughs> Yeah. What are you still curious about Greek history, mythology? Are there, do you still have big questions? Are you still exploring? Um, I am still exploring. I have, um, I have a shelf full of books over here. There is a lot that I found out about while researching the book and didn't have time to go into in depth. I would, I would love to read about the great naval battles of, of ancient times and also the more modern ones or um, Greek independence from the Ottomans. Um, yeah, next year, is a big, next year is a big year for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's the 200th. Yeah. So when we get you to Greece next year, we'll take you to Costa Navarino to uh, the Battle of Navarino Bay. Oh, I would love that. I and there are great, um, have you read the book Lord of the Sea, Lords of the Sea by um, John Hale? Professor Hale, yeah. Professor John Hale, I think he's at the University of- um, North, North Carolina, I think somewhere. I was gonna yeah. say, I think he's yeah. in Louisville. You're right, absolutely. Uh, University absolutely. of Louisville. So Mary, that's the book I'm gonna send to you. I'm teaching it. Oh, thank you. Course. I'm teaching in a course called Democratic Statecraft in the fall, which is whether democracies fight differently than non-democracies. And so, of course, we're going to start with Thucydides. Uh -huh. And John Hale's book is the best English language introduction. He was a student of Don Kagan at Yale. And okay. with, an, with another group of historians, they reconstructed the trireme. They couldn't figure out how you could get 170 rowers on one boat and uh -huh. have them row at the same time. And because uh, there were no drawings left over nor in intact replicas. They knew the length and width and they knew that there were 170. And so they figured it out. And in the run up to the Olympics in Greece, they reconstructed a trireme and had American and British college rowers row. So I'll send you the book. That's my to-do list. My, you. Gift, my gift to you. That is right up my alley because I am thinking of um, doing something for my next book. I might do something that has to do with the sea. And um, I, so I love books about naval battles. They have to be well written though. It's, it's beautifully written. Okay. 
<laughs> my, my undergraduate research assistant said it's her favorite book of the summer so far. So. Mary, one of, one of our viewers, who's a scholar actually, Tom Papadimitriou at Stockton College, uh, wanted to know what are your thoughts on, a, we didn't want to do a very controversial subject, on the return of the marbles. Think they should be returned, that is my thought. I, um, I was asked this question last year about this time in Wales. It was the first time I was asked that question while on British soil. And I was staying with a friend, a uh, British woman, who was very generously letting me stay with her. And, you know, I didn't know I was going to have to answer this question on stage uh, in, at the Hay Festival. But we were talking about that. And she said, it's just that the Victorians were great collectors. And their Lord Elgin having taken those pieces of statuary from the uh, Acropolis, that it was just, you know, what they did back then. And it beat, she said, I'm quoting, it beats having the Turks use them for target practice. So um, then, you know, my friend, my hostess is in the audience when I have to answer this question. And I, I had to be so tactful. I, I, I did say that I, that, you know, it's all over. I mean, pieces of the, uh, of, of the, from the Acropolis are all over the world now. They're in collections, right, in Germany and France, in America and in England. And that I thought maybe we had to accept the fragmentation. And um, it was a really mealy mouth answer and I regret it. <laughs> so I do think that they should be returned and that new Acropolis Museum is a, you know, a pin for their return. It's a plea for their return, it seems. I don't know that we'll, that, but maybe using that Greek War of Independence bicentennial, bicentennial, that would be a good time to press for the return of the marbles. Yeah, or at least there, there's even talk of a, of some sort of a exchange or a lending of some sort, just to have them back. Right. Mary, uh, if I can just, uh, just out of curiosity, I was a, a publisher of a magazine at one time. Um, what are some of the, just, just today, how hard is it to, to run a magazine or, or not to run it or just to operate a magazine uh, when everything is going digital? And how, how is the New Yorker handling that? Well, the New Yorker right now, you know, they're all working at home. They're putting out a fine magazine. And um, the New Yorker has always, or, you know, ever since I think when David Remnick became editor, he you know, he's a newspaper man, so it was less a literary magazine under him. But it's a magazine now with a mission. And it has been really since 9-11, I would say, that, you know, whatever, and their, their coverage of COVID and of the riots and Black Lives Matter, all of those things are, you know, you can trust the New Yorker to have really good coverage of that. What is really hard for them is, you know, the, their parent company is in a lot of trouble now because print is, it's hard to keep a print publication uh, uh, going. And it's so hard to imagine the New Yorker not being in print. You know, it's always been an object, a beautiful object. So um, we'll see, you know, not even the New York Times has any advertising in its print publication anymore or very little and you know it was it's sunday remember you used to have to take out sheaves of advertising and <laughs> the paper and now ooh, where where are all those ads i used to pull out and throw away and then they're, they're not they're, they're not there at all anymore um more and more and especially with the covid thing with the, the terrible virus we're getting so used to having to do things like this, right? To live virtual lives that I'm, I'm just really hoping we remember how to be with each other when this is over, that it does end. Yes. Michael, do you have any questions? So, um, yeah, I was just thinking about what you mentioned earlier about the characteristics of the gods and how they reflect human behavior. And it's just fascinating to me that as technology changes over the years, people's behavior stay constant. Yeah. People behave, good people, bad people, giving people, taking people, all are there throughout history. 
And through the ancient Greeks and their stories, their fables, hold true back then, and they hold true today. And with that in mind, language is expression of people's emotions. You know, we use language to convey our feelings, but also we use language to convey our knowledge. You know, as we go through philosophy and discussions, uh, cordial uh, discussions as opposed to hostile and worse. <laughs> but it seems to me that the Greek, Greek people would rather sit originally as a group, sit and discuss all sorts of emotionally charged topics and still walk away as friends or family, which for me is just stunning because it speaks a lot to the way we look at life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of cultures, you, you don't talk about you know, those topics at all. They're the they're unsung or the unspoken elephants in the room. But the Greek people are known for having the uh, conversations in the placa around the coffee all the time and they walk away, they still are friends the next day. So I'm wondering if that behavior is unique in terms of the Greek people because of what they've gone through over the last millennium. You know, they've been under Ottoman rule for 400 years, yet they try to maintain their own culture. They try to maintain their language. And obviously the religion, which could have easily been overwhelmed by the superior forces. And for me, that shows a sense of identification that they would not give up. They could have easily given that up, and they did not. They did not get assimilated into the conquering nations. So for me, I mean, just, you know, like you mentioned, 1985 was different in Greece than it is today. I'm just kind of wondering, I haven't been in the block of myself personally in a year or so. Has that, has that been changed with the integration in the uh, influx of non-Greek philosophies on non-Greek cultures into the Mecca, into the, you know, society with all the air, you know, with, with transportation being so easy these days with airlines and everybody traveling from one country to another, Europeans coming into Greece, for example. Do you th think there's any dilution to the culture? Have you seen any changes occurring over the last... 30 years, 40 years? Um, well, I, what I saw um, was more signs in English than in Greek, and also more signs in other languages, you know, that um, uh, Eastern languages with the in, influx of refugees, too. Um, but I don't think that the character has been diluted at all. And I think that's a, um, a function of having the, the common language and the religion, which, which and everybody is still connected to it. Um, and it's that, it's that connection to something that's old and true and that works that, that I think is the satisfaction that I find in, um, you know, in, in being able to see my neighbor as you know Aries with a heart of gold <laughs> um, I just like feeling that connection with with history mm. with Greek history with modern history with ancient history I like feeling connected with the world and with in time you know not just here and now but in, in other eras thank you uh, I do also want to note, and, and on the side note, um, in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, 12 years ago, we started a charter school that was bilingual Greek and English, the Odyssey Charter School of Wilmington. And yesterday was their first graduating class. Wow. So uh, well, I want to throw out a congratulations. Oh, that's okay. to that group. Congratulations. That's uh, wonderful. They, they are amazingly well speaking. It's a, uh, as a charter school, there, there's a lottery. So it's random applications, random acceptances. And it's a diverse group of students coming from all over, from all over different cultures. And all of them embrace not only their language, but the culture, speaking to the students themselves. It gives you a chill down your spine knowing how well and how fluent they can speak the Greek and have wonderful conversations in the hallways, which I had personally. And it's a stunning experience when you go through the school. So I do want to shout out to the Odyssey School and the success that they've had in maintaining the language, the Greek language, 
and obviously the culture that is embedded by the Greek teachers in the school. So that's my shout out. I'm unbashed, unapologetic for it. Thank you don't have to apologize. Actually, it's related to, the, to what I was saying. You know, I feel like I like the connection to the past, but also what I admire in what you do, you members of the National Hellenic Society, is that you are throwing it forward. You're the ones who are so determined to have your children be connected to the tradition. I think it's a beautiful thing. So Mary, with, with that, that's a great tee up for the last two questions. Art and I each have one for you. Why don't we both ask them? We'll each ask our question and we'll give you the final word before we close. My question is, um, I've, I've got at least one sitting here. What advice do you give to young writers? People who are thinking about a career in journalism or in writing, um, how, how do you think about the profession moving forward? And Art? Uh, my question is, uh... Why is Greek still and Greece still relevant today? Oh, okay. I have to These do are real softballs. <laughs> um, well, first I'll go to the um, Bill's question about writing. I have, you know, you can ask that, you can answer that question on a couple different levels. The pragmatic one, if you're going into journalism, you probably need to enter at the level of the internet now you know, to try to get a job at a magazine the way I did and work your way up. You, you know, the jobs are vir um, virtual, they're um, cyber jobs, internet jobs. Um, so some, you know, some things that I wrote about, are, they are definitely gone, you know, the age of the, the, the pencil. <laughs> um, but the other thing about writing well, uh, that's, you know, the pragmatic answer is um, learn the internet. Another pragmatic answer is get a day job. You know? <laughs> um, and do anything because if you're a writer, you know, anything is experience. But the main thing if you want to write well is to read, read a lot, read good stuff and try to know, read it. You know, you read of course for content first, but if you slow down and read things again, then you can read for how, read to help see how the writer did it. How, you know, it's structurally at the level of the sentence, the paragraph, the whole piece. Um, just read and be a bit analytical in your reading. Um, the, uh, the question about the continuing relevance of Greeks, well, you know, obviously, I think that it's, it's um, that uh, all, all of mythology is still relevant and the way that we use the names of the Greek gods, on, you know, the diners and um, nail salons and uh, <laughs> designer scarves, Hermes scarves, all of that, that is all evocative and whole and you know it's a common language it's a an umbrella greek has more of an umbrella over all of us i think than any other or at least in the west than any other um nation or country or people or language and i found you know of course i need to be optimistic we all need to be optimistic um but i have found in my, my book about English was an easier sell than my book about Greek. People are still intimidated by Greek. And, and I, my whole point of the book was it's not that hard. You know, I mean, of course, of course it's hard. Um, but the, you know, get over your fear of the alphabet. <laughs> the alphabet is not a big, not a high hurdle. So, I have spent quite a lot of time trying to convince people that that they can read, they can learn to read Greek, and I've had a little bit of success, which is wonderful. But mostly, it seems to me that all it's practically a renaissance right now of things Greek with those writers that you mentioned, um, the, with Madeline Miller and. And there's a lot of academic writing, good academic writing still going on um, about, about the Greeks and about Philhellenes, right? There's a, a wonderful book by a, um, 
Artemis Leontis that came out of the University of Michigan about Eva Palmer Sicilianos, who back in the 20s tried to recreate the, um, some Greek theater at Delphi. And that's, that's a wonderful book. And, and, you know, writing this book has given me actually a taste for more academic stuff than I ever had before, because the details are in there. And once you get a hunger for this stuff, you want every detail. So um, I think that, that, that it will just continue, Greece, Greek things, Greece will continue to be relevant. And look, at, at the in the pandemic, Greece set a wonderful example. Greece set the example of saying, our old people are important. We're not going to just let this run through the herd, as they say. We're going to protect the old people by everybody, you know, obeying and staying. And it was an example of the Greeks getting, getting together to fight a common enemy. I know you all argue a lot among yourselves, but everybody decided, yeah, old people are important. <laughs> or maybe it was the old people who were in charge. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, it worked. A pandemic Greek word. Another Greek word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pull that one out. <laughs> well, Mary, that's such a wonderfully optimistic closing note. And the thing you should know there is it was a, the current prime minister is a Greek educated in America who trusted the scientists. And that's, uh, and, and that itself is a very Greek thing going back to ancient times. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. right. And worked and worked at McKinsey. I mean, what a great combination, right? <laughs> <laughs> did he? Oh my! Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I should and follow I, the politics more off. I'll send you. I'll send you the links. Art uh, helped us. The National Atlantic Society helped us have a conversation with Prime Minister Mitsotakis a great. couple of weeks ago. And actually, uh, this coming Thursday, we'll, we will have a uh, uh, an NHS talks with the Health Minister of Greece and the U.S. ambassador and, and a very famous pulmonologist. So, so it's pretty exciting stuff. And I, wanna, I, I have to quote our friend Angelo Tsikopoulos, whose uh, daughter is actually a lieutenant governor of California, you know, who came over nothing. And, and he said, you know, if you're an American, you are Greek in many ways. And actually, Mary, I believe it's by the time you're in ninth grade, there's over 70,000 words in the English vocabulary that are Greek. Uh -huh. right? Telefono. Greek <laughs> word. <laughs> I don't know about kimono, but, but telefono for sure. So. Thesaurus, right? Thesaurus is... <laughs> Lexicon. Thesavros, gold. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So any... Uh, um, Michael, do you have any... Actually, Mary, do you have any closing words or anything else that, that we haven't touched upon? I just want to thank you so much for, for being... So oh, nice. Just thank you for being so kind to a Phil Helene. Thank you. Thank, and thanks everyone tuning in and thanks for thinking of me and thanks for reading my book. And do, you do, you will come through with that invitation to Greece, right? Somehow we'll get there during the bicentennial we're year. Gonna get you to the, we're going to get you there for the bicentennial. I would love that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? And, and on behalf of the Hellenic, Youth Club, Hellenic University Club of Wilmington, we extend our gratitude and thanks to you for, for joining us in this wonderful seminar series. And I want to ask everybody to continue to keep their eyes up for correspondences, emails, because we're going to continue our seminars throughout this uh, um, pandemic and in beyond when everybody comes back to close to normalcy because we want to learn more about the Greek culture, the Greek language, who we are, and where we're going. So please continue to join us. I want to thank Art, Bill, Mary for everything, and for Sula Mistras and Maria Karras for uh, coordinating everything in the background. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I know she's listening, Sula, because I think we'll do this with other uh, organizations around the country. What a great example and paradigm. And, uh, What's the NHS? We're all about uh, uh, camaraderie, about uh, celebrating our heritage, disseminating it to the mainstream, showing how uh, 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 that, that we are all Greeks. I think Socrates was asked, are you Greek or are you, are you a Greek? And he said, I'm neither an Athenian or Greek, 
I'm a citizen of the world. So, so these are lofty ideas, but they really aren't. And I want to invite you uh, to some of our programs that show that, that meaning, that the meaningfulness of, of, of this heritage and the legacy and, and the responsibility we feel along with the University Club and so many others in perpetuating that legacy. Because I think, Mary, two of the most important words I think that we pass on as Greek Americans are, and, and as Greeks are the words critical thinking. The, the two, those two beautiful world, words, uh, everything flows from them. And, and uh, some of the, taking these lofty things to, into the practical, some of the things we've done is we've teamed up with National Geographic uh, to produce a beautiful series called The Greek Guide to Greatness. And if you, if you punch in Greek Guide to Greatness PBS, you'll see, you'll see the series, there's short vignettes on themes like everything. You, if you watch the one on athletics or on, on social media, they're just fascinating themes brought current in a way that only Nat Geo could produce. And, and the beauty of what we're doing here that, of technology is those are shared now on the Nat Geo learning website, on PBS website, and Google Classroom. So available to millions of students. Wow. And we're sponsors also of a series. It's a wonder, Mary, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. It's called uh, My Greek Table. It's in its third season right now. It's on PBS. Master Chef Diane Kochilas, Kuch and Diane not only it's not just recipes, but she goes into the cuisina was where we all got together, you know, family, friends were you know you see like in the Big Fat Greek Wedding, five hundred people speaking at the same time, and my mother in law able to follow every conversation at the same time, but but actually it was a it was a joyous place and dinner lasted hours, and, and she not only. Uh, celebrates that cuisine, but actually goes to the, the, the different places in Greece where, where that cuisine was born and meets with the fishermen and meets with the feta cheese makers and everything. So it's just a fabulous, fabulous series. And lastly, I just have to tout our, our uh, Heritage Greece program. Um, duplicate success, we say in business, and we learn so much from our good friends in the Jewish community the Jewish American community uh, through their birthright program, which is just phenomenal. So the best, we, we try to choose the best of the best students. And this year, unfortunately, because of this uh, pandemic, uh, we canceled, but we, we were gonna send a hundred this year. We'll do it next year. And they spend time with students in Greece. And here's the beauty of the internet. Mary, you're gonna love this. It was their own idea, but the students uh, in Greece, the students from the American College, are now teaching beginning, intermediate, and advanced Greek on today. We're probably at the same time uh, uh, today to our Heritage Greece alumni. We've opened that up to any any young people that want to learn Greek, and it's you know, oh, surprising. Isn't that cool? It's pretty cool. Yeah, Actually, cool. I think I'm just going to volunteer you as a, as a lecturer, so uh, we got you. All right. Always happy to help. Thank you. So with that, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, we will stream this uh, on, on our website, which is HellenicSociety.org. And again, this is going to be shared with the National Hellenic Museum. And we look forward to future uh, episodes. And thank you, Bill. You're a good guy. Even though you're a Yankee fan, I still love you. <laughs> Go Phillies. <laughs> Nats, baby, champs. Yeah, All right. <laughs> Everyone have a great night and thank you, you so much. Thanks again, you guys. Thank you. Alinita. 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 Alinita.